we have been doing this uh, chapter 7. I'm going to try to wrap up just give you a brief, just took a couple, three minute overview of chapter 7 and then we'll finish up with our last lesson. Before we start into chapter 8, chapter 8 is where we start into the story of the maniac of Gadara. And, and I don't know why, but that's always one of my favorites. Uh, there's just so many things in there. And, and again, I mentioned it tonight. Uh, when that maniac was cleansed and all those spirits, evil spirits were removed, Jesus told him, you go and tell what I've done for you. Because that's the theme for all of us. So, as we begin studying in chapter 7, of course, our key verse there, when, and you don't have to turn to anything, we're just going to kind of overview to wrap up the last few minutes. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. And here's the phrase in that verse from Psalm that I like. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down. Because we are going to fall, right? Every one of us knows that. We do not walk perfectly. We do not walk constantly upright. We do not always walk in the light of God's word in our life because we still live in a fleshly body. We'll talk about it a little bit. But we're never cast away. We may fall. I think the old saying I've heard said before was uh, when you're on the, uh, what, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good you can fall down on the good ship, but you can't fall off of it. Is that right? Does that make sense? God's grace. Yeah, you just nod your head and say, yeah, that's right, brother. Dude. We know that's what You can always fall down, but you can never fall off. Okay? So that's where we are. We fall down. But we talked about being men and women of prayer. Uh, we talked about being men and women of faith. We talked about being men and women with a separated walk, which was a very good lesson for us. We will walk contrary to those around us if we trust in Christ as Savior. We talked about being men and women with compassionate hearts, men and women who witness. Yeah. Go and tell others what Christ has done for us. And uh, we talked about being men and women who are giving last week. Giving. And again, we mentioned tonight. <coughs> Don't let Satan lull you into thinking when you hear that word giving that it's all about money. Because it's not. It's all about the resource that God entrusted us to be good stewards with. Anytime you see that word giving, you ought to think about stewardship as well. Not just of dollars and cents, but of time, of talents, abilities, of compassion, of understanding, of counsel to others, being good stewards of what we, uh, of, of giving, what God has given to us. Now, tonight we're going to finish up with a lesson uh, entitled, Getting and Giving Might. Might. Now, when we think about that word might, something that may come to our mind, or another word that you can think of that might go along with that, is physical strength. Our, our physical self, our physical body, our physical strength. Might is defined as physical strength. The physical strength necessary to perform a function. Notice what it says at the next point. Under alphabet B it says, It is at times that we are physically weak, that we are incredibly dependent on God. Now, to make that statement come real and come to come to the light in your eyes, maybe this is true of you. You got saved and trusted Christ as your Savior at a time when your body was so physically racked up and worn out or devastated and that you couldn't do anything on your own. In other words, drugs or alcohol or uh, uh, some sort of uh, damage or destruction to your body brought you to a place where you had no physical strength. And maybe that's the time you trusted Christ as your Savior. But what the lesson is trying to help us understand is that the times when our body is weak, that's when we're going to lean on somebody else. Now, why would that be important in light of our you and what we say? When we're physically weak, we're going to lean on somebody else. Who, is, who are we supposed to be leaning on? leaning on Jesus Christ. If we've never trusted Christ as our Savior, where might we turn for that help? To Satan, to the devil. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. So you see, it's important for us to understand that our physical body is tied to our relationship to God in this manner of might. Now, it's important also that we don't rely too much on our physical strength. You know, I'm 60 years old in fairly good shape for a 60 year old, right? <laughs> but there's things that I can't do with my body that I could do when I was 20 years old, right? There's things you can't do with your body 
when you're 20 years old that you could do with your body when you were 15 years old. As we go through the natural progression of age, our bodies will lose some physical strength. But many times, we're foolish enough to think that we're still 10 foot tall and bulletproof even when we're 60 years old. And we end up flat on our back or we end up with a broken bone or we end up with a sprained shoulder or we end up with any number of things. We put much stock in our physical strength. How do I know that? Because the, the industry that drives health food and exercise is a bazillion dollar industry. I don't know how many dollars a bazillion is, but it's a lot of it. <laughs> there is lots of money spent in the world today on maintaining physical strength and gaining physical strength, increasing physical strength. Now don't get me wrong. I am not saying that it's a bad thing that you exercise and have a healthy diet. Maintaining the temple is part of our godly command, uh, commission. But we can get to the place in our hearts and our minds where we put too much stock in our physical being. Now, when that comes in conflict with God and his word, we find that that term flesh comes up. The works of the flesh. Do this. I'm strong. I'm strong mind. I'm strong body. I can do this. We'll talk about that a little bit more. We need to get that out there. Physical strength. It's at times that we are physically weak that we are incredibly dependent on God. Sometimes people, you see people that are involved, and I'll use myself as an example. I'm not patting myself on the back. Please don't misunderstand. I'll use myself as an example. I go a lot. And I'm busy. Sometimes I like to energize a bunny. And I have people in my family that are not as old as I am that say, how do you keep going? How do you keep doing that? I mean, I'll be out on chaplain's call all night. I'll run the warehouse during the day. I'll be out again that night. Sometimes I may go for three or four or five days with five or six hours sleep. And sometimes my sisters get on me and they say, why, how do you do that? Or somebody say, how do you keep doing that? I have learned this. When you depend on the Lord, for your physical strength as well as your spiritual strength, Amen. you will do things that other people would look and say they know how to do. That. That's right. And I'd say I'm not bragging on myself and tell you this is what God can do. Your physical strength, He will increase that. Well, let's look at what Isaiah says. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'll make you this promise. And I'll not condition it or qualify it in any way. If you'll spend your physical strength doing things that glorify and honor God, you will not run out of physical strength. Because God will give you that strength, but he'll also give you the wisdom and the knowledge of how to replenish and refresh your body physically, but you'll go, and you'll go, as long as you're doing the Lord's work. I know some, and a very dear friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine up in his 80s, getting close to 90 years old, and he goes, and he goes, and he goes. Of course, here lately he's had some issues with being sick, slow down, but he goes, and he goes, and he goes. Does he do it in his own strength? No, those He'll fail, he'll fall, but he does it in the strength of the Lord. So just know that if we are dependent on God for our physical strength, we will be able to do and to go and not be weary and not faint. And by the way, in light of what we have in our society today with the COVID and the, the sickness, this is my opinion, but I'll stand on it. I firmly believe that God can protect you and use you through times of sickness when it may seem like Everybody around you falling sick, but you're still going. Why is that? Because if you're doing God's work in God's way, he'll put a hedge of protection on Now, I'm not going to say that just because somebody got sick don't mean they're not doing God's work in God's way. Robbie was quarantined for two whole weeks down with the COVID, and I know her heart. But I am saying this simply. God will give you strength in your body physically to overcome diseases and sickness, <coughs> even sometimes when you don't think you're able to, to overcome it. Illnesses or, or, or bodily things. Well, that's when sometimes God gives you strength, does He not, to go ahead and do His work regardless of what kind of condition your body's in? Look at that. 
That's a testimony to that. So I believe that. But here is the here is the comma. Here's the pause. We cannot put too much stock in our flesh. Because then that's where Satan gets involved. The works of the flesh. Got some Bibles there. We're gonna look at some scriptures in the book of Romans. And you go ahead and turn to Romans, just kind of hold your hand there. I want to read to you a verse out of Matthew to kind of set the stage for the rest of this lesson. In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 41 says this. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, just a moment ago, the lesson made the statement. That when we are physically weak, we are incredibly dependent. And there's always that choice we have to make. Are we going to depend on fleshly things? Are we going to depend on things that we can do? Are we going to let Satan give us some false ideas? Or are we going to turn to the Holy Spirit? Are we going to let Jesus mount us up as wings on eagles? As eagles on wings of eagles. Now, I told you to go to the book of Romans. Let's we got to keep in our mind, even though we're talking about physical strength, we can't put too much stock in the flesh. Notice what the scripture said in the book of Romans, uh, in chapter number 7. Romans 7. Look at verse 18. This is Paul talking now. Paul the Apostle. For I know, verse 18, chapter 7, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, well, it's no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I cannot find. Paul said, this flesh, I know that in the flesh, all flesh is bad flesh. Oh, what do you mean, brother? All flesh, anything that we do in the power of the flesh is bad. You know why? Because God don't want us to do things in the power of the flesh. He wants us to do things in the power of the spirit. We'll see that in just a moment. Another verse in chapter 7, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And he goes right on in chapter 8. There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He's again highlighting that fact. We have to make a choice. We're either going to try to do things in our own spirit, uh, fleshly manner, which often turns out to be a worldly manner, or we're going to do things under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We have the choice to make. Now, if we're a born-again believer, that choice should be simple. We should be choosing the Holy Spirit, the intuitive leading of the Holy Spirit immediately. But if we've never trusted Christ as our Savior, guess what? we got a battle on our hands. Because Satan's going to bring it to us. He's going to try to encourage us to do things in that fleshly manner. And not having spiritual leadership, spiritual guidance, because the indwelling spirit is not there, we're going to be in a world of hurt. So you see, it's important that we find that time when we trust Christ as our Savior. Another verse there, look in, uh, verse, in chapter 8, verse number 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, notice the word, but if ye through the spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You see, Paul is laying it out for us very plain, very simply. We have to choose that we're going to live after the Holy Spirit's leading in our life or we're going to live after the leading of the works of the flesh in our life which Satan is going to be in control of. So you see, that brings us again to that point. We should be making that decision in our life. Am I going to continue this worldly, uh, obsessive, addictive, destructive behavior under the leadership of Satan? Or am I going to choose to have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is going to give me that leading. You see, there's a choice to make. We either choose to live that way or we choose to trust Christ our Savior and have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Notice then just a few pages over to the right, over back in Galatians chapter 5. And if you're not following along, write these scriptures down so you'll have to look at them when you get back. Right after Corinthians, you get to Galatians. Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. And this leads us right to where we're going to talk about here to finish up our lesson in just a minute. Galatians chapter 5, notice that verse number 16. And this, this right here is where we can, we can all part every day. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. 
This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're under the, not under the law. Amen. You see, again, he's making that choice, he's helping us realize either I'm going to live this life full of Satan's leadership and full of discord and self just uh, indulgence and meanness and harshness and worry and frustration and self-love, or I'm going to choose to have Holy Spirit leadership in my life, the fruits of the Spirit, which is part of the foundation of the RU curriculum, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and temperance. So again, we're faced with that choice. Now, if you've never been saved, the choice is, are you going to accept Christ? If you've been saved, you're born again believer, then you got to make the choice. Are you tired of this every day? Don't we get tired of this? Don't we get tired of this contrary fighting between the Spirit and Hey, I'm bad with too. I'm bad with too. Every day I have to make decisions about am I going to take the Holy Spirit leadership or am I going to just do what, what I want to do, what the flesh wants to do? Every day. And Paul's saying that we're all that way. And Paul, you know, he gives that famous little discourse there where he says, I know what I'm supposed to do. And I don't do it, and I know what I'm not supposed to do, and that's what I do. Well, that's the quandary we're all in. Where every one of us is right there. But once we trust in Christ our Savior, guess what? We have somebody that lives inside of us that if we would just stop and listen to him for just a moment, that intuitive leading will lead us in the manner of doing things that are not things that God would have us to do. If God's against it, so am I. How do we know God's against it? Because that word tells us because that Holy Spirit living inside of us rings that bell when we start down the wrong track. So you see, there's a choice we have to make there. We have to trust the flesh or we have to trust the leadership of the Spirit. So notice what he says and notice how he kind of finishes that up, letting us know that that's all of us. We're all in that predicament. We're all in that same way. But we have to choose the Spirit and not the flesh. Uh, to finish out that first section there under getting and giving might, C says, if we want strength, we must give our strength to God. We must wait upon him rather than waiting for him. And D right here is the, it illustrates what I was just talking about, about working for the Lord. If you serve in God's power, his spirit will do the work renewed every day. Every day, renewed. So that's how we get our strength, our physical strength, working for the Lord, choosing to do the things that the Spirit would lead us to do, not the things that we do in the flesh. And then finally, he talks about getting and giving greatness, which means to be advanced in life. Getting and giving greatness. To make great means to advance someone in life. And he goes on there and he talks about and uses uh, from Philippians the perfect illustration of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the incarnate. That means that was the that was the physical touching, feeling part of God. That's who Jesus was. But never ever, never ever did he raise himself up as I'm the Son of God. You better, remember when he stood before the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin? He told them what made them so mad? You don't have any power except God my Father gives it to you. He told them that. When he could have, and we've all heard the songs and the poetry and the praise, he could have called 10,000 angels at any time. But he didn't do that, did he? Why? Because he wasn't advancing himself. Now just think about it for a moment. That flesh in him knew that that cross was coming the next day. Didn't it, Andrew? He knew it. He knew that he was going, he knew it was going to be painful and suffering, and he knew it was going to be bloody, and he knew it was going to be awful, and he, he knew it was going to hurt. Now, I don't know about you, but I stay away from things that hurt me. I stay away from things that hurt me. I avoid things that hurt me. But he didn't do that. He didn't make himself great. He just simply said, if I be lifted up, all men will be drawn to me. He didn't lift himself up. Men are one that raised him up on the cross. Wasn't he? They raised him up. And by that power, the men are drawn to it. But he didn't advance himself. Sometimes we want to advance ourselves. Sometimes we want to play our song louder than everybody else. You know? Sometimes we want to move ahead and gain some notoriety or some greatness or some fame or gain 
something ahead of everybody else. But we must look at that perfect picture again. Hey, it's a common problem with preachers. Right, Brother Jimmy? We see it all the time. By the way, Brother Jimmy's a pastor of the church down in Columbus. We see it all the time. Preachers struggling and jockeying to lift their self up above this preacher or that preacher. To exalt their self. Proclaim their self. Now, that's not what gets the work done. Having a humble spirit like Jesus did. The Bible says that he went as a lamb to the slaughter. Not looking to lift himself up. Not looking to bring himself out of that predicament. But willingly going to do what the Father said. God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. He didn't seek to cause contention. He realized it was a waste of time to make himself look good. He was humble and lowly and considered the needs of others. Well, I'm thankful for that. You ever heard that song when he was on the cross, I was on his mind? Yeah. He was thinking about me then, not himself. He didn't focus on his reputation with God. Like I said, 10,000 angels, but on his opportunity to serve. He sacrificed his life to meet the needs of others. Bottom line, all of that, quit being a taker and start being a giver. We take a lot, don't we? I use the term a lot of times, and you've heard me use it before. I try to quit using it because it's some folks don't. A voracious consumer. Some people are voracious consumers. Voracious means they're just like a ravening animal, and they'll take all you give them, just eat it up. You give them all your attention, you give them all your time, you give them all your love, you give them all your counsel, you can give them all your money, and they just take it and take it and take it. Don't be a taker, be a giver. This whole chapter we studied, this whole section, is talking about being a giver. And remember now what the premise was. To be a giver, you got to be a receiver. That means you receive from God all the gifts. Remember, you come with a tea, teaspoon, you get a teaspoon full. You come with a cup, you get a cup full. You come with a bucket, you get a bucket full. God's economy is the receiving precedes the giving. The more that you can get from God through the study of the Word, through the leading of the Spirit, through His graciousness and mercy and His resources to you, the more you'll be able to give to others. But if you try to give to others in your own strength, guess what? You'll be frustrated, you'll be discouraged, you'll be aggravated. You'll toss them aside because human patience, fleshly patience can only put up so much. But we have not this, not quick temper, not irritability and the negativity that spikes our passion, but this right here, long suffering. I'm glad it's not as long suffering. An enduring temper that expresses itself in patience to the shortcomings of others. And every reformer in the United States, you know, I was noticing tonight when I signed up with, uh, with Josh, and signed, since we started Reformers Unitas, we have had 1,610 people come through and, and fill out the cards and register to be a part of Reformers Unitas. 1,610. Where are they at tonight? Does that mean that we give up on them? Does that mean that we toss them by the wayside? Any one of them could walk through that door right now. We yeah. receive them because of long suffering. Yeah. That was first, remember Ephesians 4 32? Be ye kind to one another, gentle, forgiving one another. Like Christ, God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. Long suffering, giving to others, giving and giving. And by the way, this long suffering, this patience with others, this giving, this love, it's just like the physical strength. The more you get it from God, the more you give it to others, the more there will be. Remember the fountain of everlasting water that springs up inside of us? Long suffering. I would love to walk in here some Friday night and 90%, or 50%, or 20%, what 10% would be what? 160 people would be standing out here in this parking lot. Former reformers and out in the streets. I'd love to see that. Are we going to see that? Probably not. Do we quit? We just keep giving and keep giving. That's the picture of Christ. He gave till his life's blood was gone. All gone. He gave it all. So giving and giving and giving and giving. I'm glad somebody gave for me. I'm glad I had a Sunday school teacher when I was 12 years old that didn't quit teaching him little hard-headed boy. I'm glad she kept giving. I'm glad Jesus gave to me. So giving and giving. Those are good thoughts for 
Let's give them an award. You got an award tonight for Nicole. Come on down, Nicole. She can't hide now. We know her by name, first name. You didn't realize it was tied, did you? Thank you. All right, let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and we do thank you for this time and thank you for this lesson tonight. Lord, I thank you for those that have come here with their hearts open. Oh, Lord, they came of their own will. They walked into this property. Nobody has dragged them. Nobody has forced them. Nobody has dropped them in here. They have come here because they realize that they need something in their life. Lord, I pray they find Jesus. I pray they'll realize that Jesus is what they need in their life. And Lord, for those who come here tonight struggling with a Christian walk, Lord, I pray that we get to that place where we understand the intuitive leading of the Holy Spirit, the long-suffering of God our Father, the giving and the giving and the giving and the giving all for our sake. And that will drive us and motivate us to be givers. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this lesson tonight. Thank you for those that are gathered here tonight. We just ask you now to bless us and encourage us as we leave here. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Yep, let's do Psalm 1. Well, Selena fires me right now. Now, for you first timers or those of you that are new here, Psalm 1 is one of our foundational passages of Scripture. And part of the curriculum, the first part of the curriculum, is memorizing Psalm 1 along with some other scriptures. And we recite Psalm 1 together on Friday nights because it gives us that feeling of unity or that bonding. It's not because we're all part of the cult. It's not nothing to do with that. It's just because we love the Lord and we love the scriptures. Psalm 1. Ready? Begin. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scorn. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, that like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation.